It's 1936. America is still reeling from the effects of the Great Depression, and Dorothea Lang is returning home from her latest assignment, documenting the hardships of farmers in the Dust Bowls of California and Oklahoma. Lang is most of the way home when she has a feeling, a compulsion as she describes it, to turn around and return to the pea pickers farm she passed 20 miles back. And it's there she discovers and makes the image Migrant Mother. Unknown to Lang and her subject, an image which will become the symbol for desperation of motherhood and of the state of American working classes in the 1930s. Lang describes making the image in a short 10 minute visit to the camp. A mother was there with her three young children, crowding together next to the remains of their car, now unusable due to having to sell the tires in order to feed the family. She looks on wistfully, troubled, wondering how a single mother in the greatest economic crisis in history, she would survive. At least, that's the story she provided her editor when submitting that now iconic image, and a story that got repeated many times in interviews and exhibition catalogues. The truth, however, is, as with many things, a lot more mundane. So who was the mother, and what was her experiences of the depression? Is it true that she was struggling to survive? What if the story we were told was an example of fake news. To understand why we have a conflict between what the image represents and the actuality of who and what is shown, we need to understand how this image came to be made and also ask the question, does it matter that it's not exactly true? Migrant Mother, Napomo, California is an image that has come to be symbolic of and synonymous with the Great Depression. It's a period of time marked by the stock market crash of October 1929 through to the initiation of New Deal programs by then President Roosevelt in March 1933. Those programs were intended to support the rejuvenation of working class farming, manufacturing, and general employment opportunities. The Great Depression marked the worst economic recession in history. Millions became unemployed, global GDP plummeted, mass migration, homelessness, poverty and illness were all widespread and unforgiving. The effects of the recession lasted much longer than the official period of 1929 through 1933 and Roosevelt's plans didn't change the circumstances overnight. But as part of that New Deal package of initiatives, 1935 marked the forming of the Resettlement Administration. The RA was formed in order to assist farmers in transitioning to more viable and profitable business models. A process which was regularly challenged by conservative politicians as being interventionist or socialist. In 1937, the RA became part of the Department of Agriculture and was renamed the Farm Securities Administration. Both the RA and the FSA understood the power of photography in documenting the agency's actions. Roy Stryker was in charge of the photographic department for the RA and transitioned to the FSA as the agency changed. Stryker was well versed in the use of photography in press, whilst there was a sense of freedom for the photographers under his direction to pursue their own interests and styles, Stryker still provided briefings and assignments designed to best represent the agency and most effectively communicate its goals. Many of Stryker's photographers were art educated, experienced with assisting or working with 19th century documentary photographers. These came from backgrounds which gave them the insight and experience to investigate the effects of the depression. Many went on to become household names. Walker Evans, Dorothea Lang, Gordon Parks, Esther Bubley, Russell Lee and many others. Their work for the FSA often led to widespread recognition and influence on the genre of documentary for the next 100 years. However varied the photographer though, Every image passed through the hands of Stryker, who would select the cream of the crop and distribute to press agencies to support the articles provided alongside those images. Those were turned into advertisements, and importantly, to illustrate the reports which were provided to Congress and used by lobbyists in securing funding for the program. Migrant Mother, made in 1936, is perhaps the most famous of those selected. Lang's image was used in advertisements, reports and news articles. Each time, it was contextualised with the subject's story, a story which, in combination with all the work of the FSA, shifted the public's perception of the New Deal programmes and dramatically increased the support from Congress and, importantly, the opposing political voices. The story that Lang discovered, the mother of this photograph on the journey home to San Francisco, became part of the contextualization of mythology distributed alongside the image, and retold many times in its future publication and exhibition. Described by Jerry Badger in The Genius of Photography, she passed a sign that read, P. Pickers Camp, 
and drove for another 20 miles before something compelled her to turn back and visit the camp. Migrant mother's contextualization included March 10th, 1936 under the heading Ragged, Hungry, Broke, Harvest Workers Live in Squalor or another version What does the New Deal mean to this mother and her child? The story of the subject selling the tyres on her car in order to feed her children persevered, along with Lang's story to being compelled to visit the pea pickers camp. And even later on, there were claims being made about how the image affected the mother. In the catalogue accompanying a recent Lang exhibit at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, exhibit curator Sandra Phillips argued that Florence Thompson's life was most likely saved by Lang's photo. As you can see from these headlines and even in Badger's excerpt, Lang is given an otherworldly power. She's not fulfilling a brief, but rather some force is compelling her to return and make a photo in order to miraculously save this family from the struggles of poverty. But both Badger, Marion and Phillips admit addressing the major issues with the story. Marion does reflect on the fact that Lang had a retoucher adjust aspects of the final image, an act which could have been claimed as manipulating the documentary validity. All fail to address the fact that the mother herself came forward many years later to deny the story that Lang had told. Florence Owens Thompson is our mother. Florence was a widow with eight children, her first six with her deceased husband, her seventh with an influential man who she left due to fearing having her children taken from her, and her eighth in 1935 with the man who Florence felt had no ability to support her family. Having taken on the responsibility of supporting the family herself, Florence was travelling to find work and a better place to live. A combination then of misogynistic views of single parent women, a fear of taking government support due to the implications it would have had on maintaining parentship of her children, and the effects of the depression, all necessitated the need to migrate. The image we now recognise was taken after her car broke down on the long journey, whilst her two oldest sons were at the nearby garage getting some parts repaired. To her, the photographer was just an unusual occurrence on the journey. Nothing to really think about again and quickly forgotten as they undertook the rest of their journey. Lang actually made six images, each one moving closer to the subject until the final image we recognise now. The close intimate proximity, the close framing which places the whole family tightly together clinging to the mother as the subject herself looks on wistfully and with considerable contemplation. The others in the sequence demonstrate that even fashioning a meaningful documentary picture is an art, one that Lang was rather good at. Jerry Badger here alludes to the process of selection and refinement, the searching and finding of the composition and framing which heightens the image from recording a scene and into iconography. This iconography has been replicated many times since, has been described as being religious and with reference to the obvious similarity between Migrant Mother and the images of the Virgin Mary. It wasn't until many years after the initial success of Migrant Mother that Thompson's sons responded to an interview request, answering many of the questions raised by this photograph. Addressing the idea that the image led to an outpouring of support for Thompson when it was initially published, Troy Owens, one of Florence's sons, answered, We were already long gone from Nipomo by the time any food was sent there said Owens. That photo may well have saved some people's lives, but I can tell you for certain, it didn't save ours. For Florence, the idea that she would need to sell her tires to support her family was an insult to her skills as a mother. Thompson took great pride in supporting her family, and it's perhaps this which stopped her coming forward after the images became famous, her pride rejecting the concept of the photograph. Unfortunately, despite the fact that this image became, perhaps, the most recognisable documentary photo of the 20th century, the truth was it had little impact on Florence's life. Struggling for years as her image became more and more popular and influential, Florence travelled the world vicariously as her face was displayed in exhibitions and galleries. In 1983, Thompson was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 79. Her care became essential. She required 24-hour support which became unrealistically expensive for the family. In response to this news, nearly 2,000 letters were received from members of the public pledging support. None of us ever really understood how deeply Mama's photo affected people. Florence died on September 16th, 1983, shortly before her 80th birthday. Unfortunately, 
Her legacy will no doubt be washed away with time as the story of Migrant Mother kind of overpowers it. The truth of the image only becoming revealed by those who seek it out. But in doing so, her legacy will also continue to have the impact it had in 1936. As a subject of a timeless and iconic photograph, Florence represented the struggles and problems of hundreds if not thousands of Americans. The image can, without doubt, be attributed with having a huge impact on the perceptions of the social support that Roosevelt's government was delivering, no doubt resulting in increasing support for initiatives like those that the FSA put forward. So we return to the question, do the ends support the means? A more truthful story, and any other of Lang's six images, may have made Thompson happier with the outcome. But would it have become the symbol of struggle that touches people even now, nearly 100 years later? Would the New Deal initiatives receive the continued support that this image and the others presented by the FSA undoubtedly helped to foster? Without the impact of these images, how many people would have suffered longer and harder? Let me know what you think in the comments. So the story really of Florence Owens Thompson is not necessarily a story of fabrication and lies, which you may associate with fake news. It's also obviously not a modern issue. It's been going on for as long as people have had agendas to push. Really, it's a story about manipulating the facts of the story to make it more appealing to what the agenda is trying to achieve. I won't answer the question of, do the ends justify the means? But I will counter, rather, with another question. Why is it that Florence's story wasn't good enough as it was? The story of a young woman who was struggling to support her family is very much the same as the story of a young woman struggling to support her family, but sold her car tires. The difference is in how Thompson perceived the story. To her, as we've already mentioned, it was an insult to think that she couldn't support her family and would need support. Personally, I find Florence's true story more inspiring for her strength and resilience in such struggling times. But I guess we'll never find out if the true story would have been good enough to support this image. As always, I wanna round up the video by saying thank you. Again, we've grown a little bit more. I've had more views and it still blows my mind that people watch and listen to and you know want to see more of this for some reason. I wanna say a special thank you to, and I hope that I pronounced this right, I'm, I apologize if I'm wrong, to Yoel who reached out to me a couple of weeks ago we an email um he'd been listening to the podcast version on spotify and it really meant a lot to me that someone took the time to offer the support and encourage me to make more videos so thank you so much for that and if you want to join our little community then you can hit the little subscribe doobly do i normally put something around here to remind you click click this channel is all about art and photography and discussing the theory and the history behind images that we see and hopefully helping you make better images by helping us understand more about what makes a good image and why it becomes iconic. That's it for today. Hopefully I'll have another video for you in another two weeks-ish. Not 100% what it'll be on yet, but if you want to suggest ideas or ask particular questions that maybe I could make a video about, feel free to hit me up in the comments or you'll find all my socials in the description along with all that jazz. Thank you very much.